Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. This is your host, Ruffin. Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to share an exciting announcement. The Future is Female is now Bridge Club. The new name is in honor of my late grandmother, Sally Michener, an avid player and a true master of the game of bridge. Like building a business or investing in startups, Bridge is a strategic game that requires complex decision-making, teamwork, and skill to win. Bridge was a game my grandmother played with her peers and taught to other women, including my mom and I. Therefore, I could not think of a better name for this new community of women in the startup and investment world. This past week, Bridge Club launched a newsletter and Slack community for female founders and funders. If you're interested in joining us in the conversation, details are linked here in the podcast. And now on to today's guest, Amy Mulk. She is the founder and CEO of Beanstalk, the future of kids entertainment, combining AI, real-time animation, and educational expertise to create engaging experiences for children. Prior to founding Beanstalk, Amy built a career in Hollywood before pivoting into tech. I am so excited to share our conversation, so let's kick it off. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the show. So excited to reconnect with you and have you on here today. I like to start every episode by talking a little bit about your career story. I know you started off in entertainment and now you are a tech founder. So can you help us understand, one, why you started in entertainment Um, the roles you had through that career, and then how you transitioned into tech. Totally. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, So I went to Syracuse uh, for my undergrad uh, degree, and I studied um, television, radio, and film. And then I also um, got really involved in public policy. I was in this public policy 101 class and it was so much fun. I cannot even tell you. And the person who runs the department, this guy named Bill Copeland is the most incredible person. And I decided to double major and to really focus on public policy. Um, My dad had worked in the entertainment industry. And so that was kind of the draw to the entertainment industry, but I was sort of like this conflicted college student. And I ended up running a program um, at the Woodley Park Center there, which was really like kind of a head start program. And um, that's kind of what I did through the public policy experience. And I absolutely loved that. So I was like always very conflicted, but ultimately, um, I, this is such a long story and I like, it's so funny. Sometimes like things come up and you're like, I haven't told that story in a long time. Um, but I actually didn't love college. And so I ended up trying to be away from Syracuse as much as possible. And I ended up in Washington, DC, um, as it's like a pilot program from Syracuse in DC. And they were like, okay, what are you going to do? Cause you have like this media thing and this entertainment thing, this policy thing, and it doesn't quite jive. Everybody had jobs on the Hill and whatnot. And so I was like, I'm going to go work for America's Most Wanted because they were based out of Bethesda, Maryland. And so that's what I did. And I worked with John Walsh and I was focused on like media and policy and it was super fun. But ultimately I decided um, to go down the entertainment industry path, at least initially. And so I got a job straight out of college working at CAA, um, which is Creative Artists Agency, as an assistant. It's very much like Entourage the show. If anyone has ever seen that, you start at the lowest level and it's like an apprenticeship and you work your way up. And so... um, I started there and I did. I worked my way up. I um, had an amazing time. And then I ultimately left CAA to go work at Lifetime because I really love the creative process. Um, I'm still very much a business person, but I love being really involved with how do we take an idea and turn it into a bigger story. And I think that's the entrepreneurial piece in me. Um, so I went to work in Lifetime at Lifetime and ultimately... You know, it's something we can absolutely talk about if you want, but through a series of decisions, I was living in Hollywood in a uh, pre-Me Too world as a woman working in Hollywood, which, as we all know, was a certain, like, had a certain 
um, level of demand and also I think um, making some concessions in life and you really had to work so much harder as a woman and also um, give up a lot. And I really wanted a work-life balance. I had met my husband. I knew I wanted to start a family. And so we moved back to Denver where I had my first child and I was like, how do I put my policy and my um, entertainment background to good use. And that's really where I came up with this idea for Beanstalk. And I wanted to create a better screen time solution for kids. And so that's, that's how it started. Amazing. Um, So perfect transition to tell us a little bit about how you first crafted the idea for Beanstalk. Were there certain problems you saw? um, And what was like the first iteration of it? Yeah. So as I alluded to, I, um, you know, working with kids was something that was really important to me. I did that in college. I have always been really interested just personally in how we figure out how to create a more equitable foundation for kids early on, because we know so much of what comes in life for children is based on what they get in those early years. Really so much, pretty much all brain development happens between the ages of zero and three. And so often that's the time where people don't have the support they need because there isn't really a universal system. I know we're working hard to make that, but it's something that doesn't really exist and probably needs to exist. Um, And so taking that with my background in entertainment, I was thinking about people who have made huge impacts, like the Mr. Rogers of the world, the Sesame Streets, really being able to bring screen time into kids' homes. And somebody who I really admire is a woman named Angela Santamero, who is the creator of um, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. And what is so interesting about Angela is she has a background in entertainment and in childhood development. And there's this whole philosophy around a joint media experience for kids so that when they're watching screen time, a parent or a guardian or a friend or whoever is watching it with them um, and engaging with them. Like, how do you think the character feels and all these different aspects? But that's really hard for parents because so often they're using screen time as a babysitter or a way to get things done. Um, And it's inevitable. We all do it. And so really, I wanted to take what the greats had built and take it to the next level of interaction and think about how we could actually make screen time live and interactive for kids. So that was the problem that I wanted to solve um, was creating live interaction so that it took the burden off of the parent to always be there watching with their child. Awesome. And so explain what the first iteration or the product today of being stuck. Yeah, yeah. So the first iteration was in my friend's house who um, is a teacher. And literally it was me with the camera and her in her kitchen kind of just doing these fun, crazy activities with kids and engaging with them. And honestly, it's so much fun. Just that piece of a startup. I love like the early, early stage where you are so scrappy. You literally have nothing. We had nothing. And we were just trying to build this. And she was a great friend to help me. Um, ultimately what happened, um, was I got accepted into Techstars Boulder, which is an accelerator program. And that really kind of launched our ability to grow as a company. So we were just at that time really focused on just even finding out if people liked this idea by like inviting friends. Sometimes we post in Facebook groups, Hey, Sunday mornings, we're doing this interactive class taught by Miss Rachel. Come hang out with us. Not the Miss Rachel, who is now a, like a huge YouTube star, but the original one that helped be in stock. Um, and people would come and they'd give feedback and we learned so much. And then when we got into Techstars Boulder, we were able to really define what the product was. Um, We also were in Techstars during COVID. Well, when COVID happened, so literally sitting in the office in March when they're like, okay, the whole world is shutting down. And all my cohort T's um, were sitting there like, oh my God, we're never going to be able to raise money. This is our businesses are going to fail. And I was like, I think this might be the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> and not really, of course, COVID's awful, but it was amazing to be a solution that could help people during the pandemic. 
And so for us, it was a little bit of, obviously we had this awesome product that we're excited about and then luck that we literally were exactly what everybody in the world needed at that very moment. And that was, that was crazy. Definitely want to talk about the COVID rush and COVID boom that your business saw. But before, can you share for other founders that might be looking at a program like Techstars? Can you tell us a little bit more about like where your business was at that time and maybe why you think your company got into the program? For sure. So um, first of all, I live in Denver and I am really involved in the startup community here. I was before I got into Techstars, just networking and wanting to support other entrepreneurs. Um, and Techstars is actually, it originated in Boulder. Um, that's where it was founded. Um, and now it's a worldwide program that's incredible. Um, and you can, there's so many different programs that you can do within the Techstars organization. Um, but I obviously had a near and dear place for it in my heart because it's kind of a homegrown situation. And so, um, Boulder will, and I think honestly, Boulder is, will always be kind of the gold standard, their program, um, just because it's so amazing, but that's my biased opinion. Um, so the the reason I decided to do an accelerator is, you know, I, I think when you're thinking about how you want to start a company, there are lots of different ways to go about it. And a lot of, you know, some people bootstrap. We really had big, like a very big vision for this um, in terms of it being like a destination for people to come and consume entertainment for kids, something really, really big. And I always knew that I wanted to be venture backed. And so kind of once you make that decision, it, it helps you with how you're going to take your path. And for me, my biggest goal was to create this incredible opportunity to connect with kids on a really large scale. And I wasn't so worried about my ownership of it or any piece of that. It's really about building this into something big. And so I was very open to bringing in venture money. And so I really felt like doing an accelerator was going to be the best way to do that because I didn't have any experience with startups. Literally, I had no idea. Um, and so I got to know the managing director here. Um, at the time, it was this great guy named Natty Zola. He now is no longer um, the managing director, but I got to know them really well, got to learn what they were looking for in the program. And ultimately, I, you know, I think when you're thinking about an accelerator, first of all, even within Techstars, different programs are looking for different things. Um, but really specifically for the program that I was in in the thesis, they wanted to know that you had a great founding team. And this is pretty universal, a great founding team. And a, you know, a really good idea of how you might solve a big problem. And it doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, product market fit. You kind of have to have problem market fit. Like, you know, there's a problem and you know, there's a market for it. And you have validated to some extent what you're going to do. And that's where we were at. We had that slight validation that people were really enjoying this based on our Sunday morning classes that we did out of Rachel's house. And that was enough, um, along with an amazing founding team, a big vision and a really strategic plan of how to kind of get to each milestone. And so we were accepted into that program and it was incredible. Very exciting. So before you did Techstars, coming from entertainment, how did you even learn? Like, should I pursue accelerators? Should I pursue VC funding? Was that just a matter of networking and kind of trying to understand the space? It really was. Um you know, it was, it's so hard, honestly, to like, think back um, to, you know, exactly what it was like and what happened. But, um, you know, there, there were a few pivotal moments. So first of all, you know, it's all about connections, right? So my, um, my husband actually is the one who knew Natty um, because he, um, my husband's in, he's a product person. Um, he, he, so he works in the business space, but in the product world. And he was like, you should meet Natty. And so he introduced me to Natty who was like, oh, you should meet so-and-so and you should meet so-and-so. And my goal was always, and this is 
always been my goal. It's you leave a meeting with five introductions. Like that's how you network. You are like, okay, who can you introduce me to? You follow up, you meet with that person. I need five more introductions. And so Natty was obviously a huge, a huge intro um, because he's so connected in in the tech world here in Denver and Boulder. And that was awesome. Um, and then another intro was I was introed to a random VC in Silicon Valley who had was never going to invest in ed tech, but um, I got connected to him and he and I hit it off amazingly well. And he actually introduced me to um, an associate at a, a tech fund in Silicon Valley and they never invested in Beanstalk, but he, this guy, amazing person who um, I met uh at an ed tech fund. His name is Vinit. Um, he introduced me to my first angel investor, who was a guy named John Danner. And John, along with tech stars, it kind of all happened at once. That, that's how these things go, right? You, you get a whole group of funding when one person is excited about you. So the fact that we had tech stars and this um, angel investor, John Danner, really interested in Beanstalk at the same time, kind of started to propel us. And it's all about networking. And when I say networking, you know, I don't really like going to network events. I am an introvert at heart. People are always shocked by that because I come across very much as an extrovert. Um, so networking events make me really uncomfortable. So when I say networking, that's one way, of course, but it's about getting those personalized relationships. And then once you're in there, being relentless about getting the follow-up conversations to various people. Um, that is really, I think, what propelled me so fast is I just met tons of people and I just asked lots of questions. And I was really humble. I honestly was very honest with people. You know, I have this incredible expertise around entertainment. I know I can crush it. Um, another superpower of mine is that I can build incredible teams, which obviously as a CEO, that's a really important piece. And outside of that, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So tell me what to do. And I think that people appreciate that. I love that advice of getting five intros after every conversation. That's you know, in my head, I'm like, one intro is amazing, but I'm going to have to seriously bump that up. I love that advice. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, so I, I'm always I'm always raising the bar uh, for better or worse. But I believe that you should just shoot, go for the stars. I mean, that's we it's it's a numbers game. Definitely is. OK, so you're in tech stars. You've gotten your first angel investment and then COVID hits. You had been running these kind of like test interactions with Rachel. Tell us what happened next. <laughs> it was so insane. Um, so we had when when you so oh this is another piece of accelerator um, kind of thing is accelerators invest in your company. So not only do you get to go to the program to learn, but they actually cr make an investment in your company. And so I can't remember the exact amount. I think it's somewhere around a hundred thousand dollars, maybe a hundred and twenty. I can't fully remember. Um, that TechStars takes for um, a percentage of your company. And so we had that money that. But, you know, at the time, of course, I wasn't taking a salary and we had a very lean team. So we were not burning very fast. Um, but basically, when COVID hit, I was like, OK, we actually it was so counterintuitive. We actually got a studio where we started creating these live shows with this talent that we had found. Um, and we were able to do that because we were an we were um, an essential business because we were helping kids during COVID. And so we quickly did that. People started throwing money at me, which I, I know that sounds really weird because trust me, after that experience, it has been all downhill from there. Um, so fundraising is insanely hard, but I did have a moment where I felt what it's like to have people throwing money at you, um, which was very cool. And um, I hope we get back there um, very quickly. Uh, but we just started cranking out content. And then I instead of paying for marketing, because I was like, I don't really know what Google ads are going to do right now. I just was like, we need all the PR in the world. So I hired a PR team out of LA that I had worked really closely with. They were doing nothing because they had nothing to promote. So I negotiated as a sick deal. And we were featured everywhere. We were, I think we were featured in like over a hundred publications. I was um, featured on um, CNBC, 
um, alongside some really incredible women that to this day, I'm like, I can't believe I was in that article with these other women. Um, and we offered Beanstalk for free to everyone. And so in about a month, we had grown to over 10,000 users and it was, it was out of control. It was so much fun. And also, so terrifying um, because it was COVID and nobody knew what was going on, but it was really, I can't explain it to you to log into a zoom meeting because we ran on zoom. So like the show was built in a studio and then we broadcast it through zoom where the kids could join live and they could see each other. Um, And you would see hundreds of kids just like lighting up. And it was such a beacon of hope during such a weird time. Um, it, it really was incredible. Wow. So were you doing one show a day or were there like multiple shows a day? Yeah. So we, we scale pretty fast. I would say like on average, we were doing about four shows a day. And then what happened was as we evolved as a business, and this is part of the reason we now have pivoted, which I'm sure we will talk about, but um, you know, during COVID it was, it was okay because everybody was home. And so appointment viewing was very normal. Kids were doing online school. There were, you know, all different kinds of schedules and almost it helped parents to have a schedule because it was like, okay, this is how my kid's going to do this. But when we came out of COVID and people went back into the real world, appointment viewing was no longer a thing. So we tried to put on as much content as possible. And then ultimately what ended up happening is we kind of did a block system. So like we'd have from like eight o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock in the morning. um, And kids would just be on the entire time. And we do all sorts of different things. And we would do shows that incorporated making snacks. So the kids were like in the kitchen making snack. We just were really trying to be there for parents to keep their kids busy um and it, it was really cool so cool uh, yeah the need especially during COVID it was insane yes. yes where were most of your users at that time in terms of geographically yeah all over I mean 40 percent of our user base was outside of the U.S. it was it was an absolutely insane and that was another big piece of like how I wanted to start Beanstalk and we'll see if this you know, if someday we do a full circle, but I thought, how cool would it be if we could like connect kids from all over the world so that, you know, we're always talking about how we want our kids to have diverse experiences. We want them to like understand how the real world works. We don't want them to grow up in a bubble or whatever, or, you know, or maybe they're growing up in a situation where they want to see, you know, maybe it's not ideal and they want to see that there are other opportunities, other places, other kinds of people, you know, I just really wanted to make it so that everybody was on the same playing field. And that was what was so cool. Like, I I can't remember, there was one we we were doing, we had this show where we took kids all across the world and we were in Belgium. I can't remember what, we were in some small town in Belgium. That was like the story. And all of a sudden you see these kids like going crazy in the Zoom video. And so the the character unmutes them, the teacher, whatever you want to call him. And he's like, what, what do you have to say? And they're like, And so they became part of the show because they actually were in this small town in Belgium. Um, And like that was the thing that was totally the magic of that phase of Beanstalk. This sounds fun for me. I want to, I want to do so much fun. Which countries of the 40% that were outside the US, what were like the major countries people Um, were in? We had a lot of people um, in the UK. Um, and we had, I'm trying to think where else, um, the biggest, that was really the UK was the biggest, um, the biggest and also Brazil, like lots of people from Brazil as well. So COVID starts to wind down, kids return to school, people return to like their normal schedules. How did your team pivot? We had really anticipated kind of what was happening, um, And at the same time, we saw a tremendous opportunity. So during COVID, obviously so many companies started to innovate. And part of that innovation was around like, how do we make work from home easier, more accessible? Like, how do we support parents? It really became like more of um, 
of a need that, that, that employers were really thinking about. And so we actually made a deal, Bright Horizons, um, which I, Bright Horizons is a huge company that offers um, daycare centers, but they also do HR benefits for lots of different companies um, and all around family planning and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and they had acquired a company called Stephen Cates, which is an actual in-person camp. And Stephen Cates was tasked with building a backup care situation. So like kind of a drop-in daycare, if you will, but online for uh, for Bright Horizons customers, which are these companies that then would offer that as an HR benefit. So we became their backup care provider and we had like huge success doing that. Um it was really, really amazing. And so that with that partnership came more funding. So we were able to raise um, our like official pre-seed round, which was a little over a million dollars, um, kind of on this thesis of we could sell this as an HR benefit potentially. And at the same time, we also knew that we were really going to have to evolve because we were even concerned about the HR benefit. We were like, we're not sure where that's going. People are going to go back into the real world. We have to be like ahead of this. And so we had been tracking the AI world, um, but we also knew that we were way ahead of our time. Like, you know, we certainly weren't going to be building open AI. <laughs> like that was not what we were doing, but we needed someone like that to be coming to the forefront so that we could figure out like, how could we make these characters in a way that doesn't require real humans? And so the team had been thinking about that. Um, my co-founder Tarun um, is a product person. He comes from Twitch and he really was like thinking a lot about how do we do that? Um, but we were also way ahead of our time. So we're running these amazing classes and shows and we're thinking about that. And all of a sudden, just like, we took such a huge hit. Everybody went back to the real world. We lost basically almost all of our subscribers um, over the course of three months. And I started just doing crazy customer interviews. And everybody was like, we love Beanstalk. We think it's the most amazing thing in the entire world, but we like our kids are in school. We need like we need this at eight o'clock at night. We need this at, like at the most unpredictable times when a parent just needs screen time for their kids. And what happened was we we didn't see a path to scaling that with real humans, because when you're planning something that, you know, it's like planning a fitness class, even an online fitness class, even if you look at Peloton, like the reason Peloton so it, it, like so, you know, successful is partly because of their on demand experience. And you can't have that when you're creating live interactive content. So we really straight up were like, this model doesn't work. And that was a really hard moment for me. Um, but we had money in the bank, not a lot, but enough. And I made the really, really hard decision of letting our entire production staff go and just keeping on our head of product and a developer to figure out what the pivot is. Um, and I told all my investors, I know there's a pivot with AI, um, but I don't know what exactly what it is yet. And I'm shutting everything down with money in the bank so that I can fund the pivot because we were going into the recession. I knew that I was not going to be able to raise money and I wanted to really be cautious. And so that that's what I did. And I remember last time we talked, you said maybe investors had questioned your decision there. Is that true? Yeah, it was really interesting. So some of my investors were... Like what? And then some of my other investors, it's so funny. Um, since you know this is all about empowering females, I'll just tell it to you straight. Um, a lot of people are like, only a woman would do that. Like any man would either try to sell this for peanuts so that their ego could be, you know, oh, I sold my company, even though what does that even mean? And or they'd run it into the ground and just call it a failure. And so I, first of all, love embracing failure because I believe that failure is how we learn and grow. So I was like, well, that failed. And I was really proud of it. But I was also really proud that I gave myself a lifeline. And like, I just, you know, there's a Babe Ruth quote around the idea of like, you just, you can't beat the person that's not willing to give up. And so that's very much who I am. I'm not willing to give up. And so I believe that every, there's a solution to every problem. You just you have 
to be the one that doesn't give up. And so that's really my mindset. And um, some of my investors are like, that's awesome. <laughs> and others are like, why don't you just like call it quits and be a mom? Um, which is kind of, I, I, it's weird. It's been really weird. So since that update of like, okay, this is not working. Where have you taken the business since then? And where are you yeah. today? Yeah, so I'm super excited. We um we're we just last night pushed um to production our POC. So I've been playing with it. Um basically we are creating AI powered um real-time animated kids characters. So they're focused towards preschool age kids and they are powered by AI and then they're animated in real time so that kids can actually engage and interact with the character who talks back, um, who sees them, who hears them, who ultimately will be able to recognize their facial expressions and um, it's really, really exciting. And so the whole idea right now is just, we built out a proof of concept before we did this, we did so much customer research about how people felt about AI, would they be willing to put their kid in front of it? And we really have developed it with all of that in mind around these parameters of the customer research that we did. Um, and so right now we're just trying to, it's really proof of concept. It's like, we have this Tech, you know, we're, we're built on obviously already existing APIs, but we're focused on the preschool age kit. So there's so many nuances to that, like um, voice to chat and the way the kids speak is so different than the way even, you know, the way a preschooler speaks c compared to how an eight-year-old speaks is completely different. And so we are training this model to really understand how kids talk, how they engage, like the different pathways they go down. And we have our head up, we, she's our chief, we call her our chief psychology officer, but she's um, an early childhood development specialist who's helping us, you know, think about these things ahead of time. But really the whole point of this is to actually learn from kids and their engagement and to create a model that then works. And so that's what we're focused on right now. Um, we haven't launched it to the public yet. I'm guessing that's probably like three to four weeks out. Um, and even then it will be like a soft launch to friends and family. Um, and we're raising money so that we can continue to build this POC. Um, I'm talking to lots of different people about various partnerships um, because obviously there's a lot of opportunity to take brands that already exist and help their characters become interactive. And so um, I spend a lot of time working on that as well right now. Very, very cool. We are truly living in the future. This yes, sounds for sure. crazy. I'm curious, have there been any like hesitations or reservations from parents um, seeing their kids use a product like this? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's such a huge responsibility to to put something in front of a kid that can grab, you know, information from anywhere um, and, and then bring it back. So that's such a big piece of this is like, how do we make this as safe as humanly possible? And, you know, luckily we're, you know, part of what we're built on is chat GPT and they've done an incredible job of setting up parameters and then uh, making it, you, you know, making it so that we can set up even further like rails and parameters. And so, you know, we, we, we absolutely are doing that. And we are trying to think of every last thing you could possibly think of. Um, but for sure, it's a risk. And I think that that's, I, I, I think technology in general is a risk for parents. I mean, we went through that whole thing with YouTube where kids were seeing, you know, things that they shouldn't see. And, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, for me as a parent, I'm like, oh my God, this is so scary. And then I think about it and I'm like, if I wanted anyone to make this product for my kid, it would be me because I, I, it's for me, it's about connecting with kids. It's about the child. It's about the customer first. It's not about like, how can we service the brand? How can we make this bigger? How can we make it addictive? How can we do all those things? That is not what is guiding this. It's really about how do we serve our customer, which is the child and obviously the parent as well. And so I think that it's going to take a little bit of a leap of faith for people to get used to this, but I think it's going to become part of kids' worlds inevitably. And so I think it's super important that we have a safe place for young children to learn what safety is. And that might even be a part of what Beanstalk is, is helping teach kids how do we be safe while we are interacting with, you know, 
with technology. Um, so we're just doing our very best. And that's, you know, I'm sure there will be little hiccups. But we are doing a we are doing our job so that there's no big hiccups. That's the goal. Very true. I also feel like I need a lesson in how to safely use AI. So yes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. But like I said, there are so many, um, there's so many ways that we can make this really safe. And that that of is first and foremost is kid safety. Um, and outside of that, then it's around them enjoying and growing and learning um, and doing all sorts of cool stuff. So as we start to wrap things up, first, any specific partners that you're looking for that you want to plug here? Yeah, I mean, we are looking for all different kinds of content creators um, to work with them. We have ways where we're also thinking about how we can make life easier for content creators by plugging in some of our characters so that they have a little bit less work. Um, we are actively um, seeking investment right now. So anyone that is interested in, you know, learning more about what it would be like to be an investor or partner in Beanstalk. And then just generally anyone that cares about the kids space um, I'm or really any space, um, you know, I'm always open to connecting. I, I love connecting. And I believe, as I said, that there's no relationship that like it, you just never know where you're going to find your next partner, your next idea, your next anything. Um, and so I'm always open to connecting. And where can people find you and where can people find Beanstalk? I am most active on LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn gal. So I'm just Amy Molk on LinkedIn. Um, I need to get better about Twitter, but um, I definitely like have my presence on LinkedIn. And then um, for Beanstalk, we're just Beanstalk. Um, AI.com. I am also a LinkedIn gal, so I get it. Yeah. And then finally, can you share a female founder, investor, or leader who inspires you and a little bit about why? Cool. Yeah. I have two. Um, so first is a woman named Michelle Kidley, who when I started at CAA, she was the head of the foundation there. So she ran all the philanthropic, but ultimately she was secret, secretly like the Jiminy Cricket of the company. She was the moral compass. Um, she had her hand in absolutely everything, but it was like the best kept secret in Hollywood, but not really. Um, now she's the chief innovative officer there. And just what I love so much about Michelle is during... Um, Hollywood's changed a lot, but when... I was there really, you know, as a, as a, you know, brand new straight out of college woman starting out in the entertainment industry. Um, there are all different kinds of women, but for the most part, I think a lot of female executives in Hollywood just shut off certain kind of softer pieces of them and really just honestly were these hard asses um, because that's how you had to succeed. You just really had to be a bull. And Michelle, in it just she was the, is the strongest person that is also able to capture this like soft side and create like a place where really you can be multi dimensional. And I thought that that was so incredible. Um, not only that, but also her, you know, she was so dedicated to making the world a better place um, and and using that then to drive business. And it was just so smart. And um, I just really, really admire her ability to be so multifaceted in a world where women are not always that way. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And then we're super lucky. We um, Our lead investor um, is Reach Capital, who was founded by two women. And I just admire them so much because it they, they've created, it's very similar to what I have to say about Michelle also, but they've created a place where the, the, the different pieces of being a woman in business are so embraced. And like, you know, people talk about being on maternity leave and what they did. And it's in a way that is just so incredibly, um, accepting of all different kinds of people and different walks of life and the way that we all just kind of uniquely want to be ourselves. And I think that that is, I, I think it's very hard to capture that sometimes as women really are trailblazers in this space. And um, I admire that so much. And I really hope that that's something that I can build within Beanstalk. 
Thank you so much for sharing both. And thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your story and more about Beanstalk. It was such a fun conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Play Bridge podcast. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And for more updates, make sure to follow us on social at Bridge Club. That's at B-R-Y-D-G-E-C-L-U-B at Bridge Club on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube.